So, uh, you know, over this last couple of weeks, we've been thinking about uh, our sort of Advent series, looking at the day of the Lord. And this is continuing in that, in that, um, in that vein, still looking at the day of the Lord and thinking about what it means for God, what it means for Christ to come to us. And this vision here of Zechariah is focused on that, but really it's it's focused on the future, still focused on the end, I guess the, the fulfilment of all of those things. And I think it's important not to get bogged down in the details here. Um, now, something which I was just thinking about this this morning, actually, uh, something which might help you to think about how to understand prophecy is that prophecy, it's, it's not so much the ins and outs and the specifics of the details that are significant. It's more, prophecy is more like a, an impressionist painting, if you like. They sort of give you the impression of it using concepts and using language which were understandable to people at that time. But it's not the case that we are supposed to look through every detail of this and say, you know, living water will flow from Jerusalem, half of it to the east and half of it to the west, and think, well, there's going to be a river flowing from a particular earthly city in two directions. You know, that's not the point. We're supposed to, to look kind of more broadly. And that's what we've got to do as we look at this passage. We've got to think more, more widely about what's happening here. Um, so what is going on? This is, this is sort of focused on the end. And those of you who were here in the summertime and before, as we were looking at Revelation, will see some parallels, I hope, as we go through, if you remember what we did back then. Um, so it starts out with um, it says a day of the lord is coming but it says when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls i will gather all the nations to jerusalem to fight against it the city will be captured the houses ransacked the women raped so it, it looks like defeat it looks like a day of defeat it looks like the day when god's enemies uh, are victorious over god's people and it's it's got a universal scope and it says there it is you know this is why it's important to kind of um, to think about um, you know have your eyes open if you like through this I will gather all the nations it says all the nations to Jerusalem now that hasn't happened has it and that's because it's it's in a sense yet to happen it is simply as we read in Revelation this is what happens that uh, the, the people the world will always be at war with God's people. That's what this is referring to. And it appears that there will be some kind of final conflict um, one day where the, the world will be uh, try to, to defeat God's people in, in some respect. We don't know what exactly that will look like, but this is what is prophesied all the way through the Bible, really. Um, the, the, the conflict will come to a head. Um, but... Just when all seems lost, says verse 3, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. Just when all seems lost, the Lord steps in and turns defeat into victory. And, and that, again, is just what we see in the book of Revelation. And in fact, it's just, you know, given a verse there, really, isn't it? You know, the Lord defeats. He, he wins the battle. There's no fight you know, it's just the Lord's victory, like that. It's, it's done. And um, he says, uh, on that day, verses, uh, verse 4, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, um, and uh, you will flee by my mountain valley. So God will make some sort of miraculous way for his people to escape. He will make a miraculous way for his people to, to be safe. And then, it says, then the Lord will come and all the holy ones with him. So um, God will, uh, will rescue his people, uh, but his coming is kind of a, a big thing which, you know, shakes the earth. And this is um, a, a theme all the way through the Bible. You know, think about um, Psalm 97, uh, for example. This is um, Psalm 97, verse 5. Let me just read that out to you when I can find it. Um, pages get stuck together, don't they? Here we go. Right. Uh, the mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. And that's how 
what the earth is like to God. You know, the mountains melt like wax. You think that the mountains look so big and, and imposing, but to God it's just like wax. They're, they're just, you know, do God's bidding. That's the thing. And he will rescue his people. And it turns out that this war which the world has been waging against God is actually a trap. And that they, they've come to wage war against God's people, but actually God says, no, I'm waging war against you. I brought you here to defeat you. That's what, what is going on. So what does God's victory look like for his people? And this is what the next few verses, verses 6 to 11, are about. It talks about it here in verses 6 and 7, about there being neither sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness. It will be a unique day. When evening comes, there will be light. So there will, there will just be continued light on that day. Think about what it says in Revelation, if you remember, in the holy city, where it needs no light, for the Lord God is its light. Um, and then it goes on, verse 8, uh, on that day living water will flow out from Jerusalem, uh, to half to the east and half to the west, in summer and winter. So all through the year, to both directions, if you like, to, you know, east and west. I think it's, it's meant to be really all over the world. That's the point of it. Now, who promised living water? Who talked about living water? It's picked up. It's picked up by Jesus, isn't it? That's right. And we know from what Jesus said, from what it said later, it's referring to the Holy Spirit. So again, you know, there's just these indications that this is more than simply an earthly kind of physical event. This is representative of something big happening. This is what is, what is going to happen. And it says in verse 9, The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord, and his name the only name. So there will be a king on the earth, and there will be no more rivals. There will be no more kings who are claiming to be gods, but will worship instead the one true God, and his name will be the only name. You know, the one that all other kings and all other rulers, and everyone gives their allegiance to. There'll be one king and it will be the Lord. And then verses 10 and 11 says the whole land um, will be like the, the Arabah. It will, um, it says verse 11, it will be inhabited, never again will it be destroyed. Jerusalem will be secure. So there'll be security and peace and blessing for God's people as God promised. That's what God intended as he led his people into the promised land. But it was never really fulfilled in those days. But this is what God is saying, that in that day, there will be peace, there will be blessing, there will be security forever. So what does the day of victory look like for God's enemies? And this is what the next few verses are about, verses 12 to 15, in very graphic language. Uh, but it talks about the plague uh, of them, even when they're standing on their feet and, and so on. Um, and um, it says even, verse 15, a similar plague will strike the horses and mules. So all of the animals that were involved in their army, even, even they will be, uh, will be struck. And, um, and it says, uh, verse 17, uh, no, that's not, not verse 17, uh, verse uh, 14, um, the wealth of the surrounding nations will be collected. Great quantities of gold and silver and clothing. So, so, so the, the nations who've waged war against God's people will be plundered. Just as in verse 2 it says, the city will be captured and the houses ransacked. You know, so as Jerusalem itself was plundered, so the people, the, the nations who waged war against God will be plundered. Um, and then in verses um, 16 to 19, we see what's going to happen after that to the rest. You know, the rest of the, the nations, those who did not come to, to wage war. What of them? It says, um, then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up to worship the King, the Lord Almighty. But if any of the peoples do not go up, um, they will have no rain and they'll bring on them the plague he inflicts on the nations. Um, so the choice is either to worship the Lord or to suffer the same fate as the nations, the same judgment as the nations who've waged war. Now this is how God is victorious. He's victorious either 
by bringing punishment upon those who disobey him or by turning his enemies into friends. That's how God does things, either by bringing punishment on his enemies or by turning them into friends. That's what, that's what God does. That's how he operates. And that's what we see happening in, in this short um, passage here. And then it finishes off, verses 20 and 21. It says, On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the sacred bowls in front of the altar. Um, so it's, it's basically saying that there will be no more sacred, secular divide. It's saying that, you know, that in the days of, of the tabernacle and the temple, they needed to be separate instruments which were you know, separate bowls and things which were used just for that purpose of use in the temple. And that was because the sin of the people sort of corrupted the ordinary things. But it's saying there's not going to be that divide anymore because there won't be any more sin and darkness. Everything will just be holy to God. Life will just be, all of our, our lives will just be holy to God. It will be life as God intended it. No more sin, no more disobedience, no more death. All of the things, all of those things, you know, it will just be holy to the Lord, all of it. There won't be any need to have things which are dedicated to God because everything will be. And that's the point of what, what Zechariah is prophesying. And it says, the last words, it says, on that day, there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord Almighty. And if you look at the, the footnote there, it says, or a merchant, and I believe that is the sense of what Zechariah is, is saying, that I think a Canaanite was the word that they used. Um, but it's talking about, you know, think about Jesus driving out the, um, the sellers from the temple, saying that the worship is going to be pure. You know, the worship of God is not going to be corrupted by buying and selling or by anything like that. But it will be pure worship. It will be, again, worship as God intended it to be. Now... I know that's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour through that whole passage and like I said it's like an impressionist painting there are so many details that we could have gone more into um, but I hope that that's helped to give a little impression of it it's talking about the end that's really what it's talking about that time when the Lord comes when Jesus returns and everything will be made new and perfect and that is the thing that all of this is fulfilled in Jesus isn't it Every bit of this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So let's look at a few ways of how this is fulfilled in Jesus. So Jesus came as a saviour. We were thinking about how God uh, turns his enemies into friends. And that is what Jesus does. It says in, in Colossians, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. It says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So that's how God makes his enemies his friends. It is by laying the punishment for sin on Jesus Christ so that all who turn away from their sin, repent of sin, turn to Jesus Christ as Saviour, will become friends of God, will have a way to him, as it says, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And that way is open through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the wonderful thing that God has done for us in Christ Jesus, has opened the way. And it is so that we can then live for God. This is what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, he has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So he's called us, uh, saved us and called us to a holy life. That's what God does. He, he saves us and then calls us to live a holy life. So we are to, to begin, even perhaps in small ways, to, to start living the kind of life which Zachariah could see. Now, no sacred secular divide, but actually we are meant to be holy to the Lord all of our lives. Not just the bits when we're here in church, 
but the bits when we're out there as well. You know, our, our lives are to be holy to the Lord. That's what God calls us to through Jesus Christ. So Jesus came, comes as a saviour, but he will come again as a judge. And we know this from lots of places, but let me read you 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. He, Jesus, will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marvelled at among all those who have believed. Very a Zechariah 14 passage that, isn't it? Very much the same kind of thing. And I think this just goes to show, I know some people say to me, you know, I feel I struggle to read the Old Testament and I can understand that. But when you see it, you see that the message is the same. It's exactly the same, isn't it? The same message from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's just in the Old Testament they didn't see it so clearly because they didn't see Jesus in the way that we do now. But it's there. The message is there, isn't it? And Jesus will come again to reign as king. It talks in Revelation about, uh, it talks, sorry, in um, Zechariah about how there will be one king. And that king we know is Jesus. Let me just read you one more verse here from Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. The kingdom of the earth has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah. He will reign forever and ever. That's the Lord who we remember at Christmas time coming to Bethlehem. He will one day reign forever and ever as king. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. So this is, this is the thing, you know, we've been thinking all the way through this Advent time about, you know, people coming to Christmas carol services, people coming into church at Christmas and just not recognising that Christmas is something with eternal significance. And that's something I, I, I really wanted to emphasise, particularly from Zachariah, but through everything that we've been looking at, that Christmas is something which has eternal significance, not just significance for once a year or for one or two services a year. It's something which is significant forever. It changes our lives every day. It should do. Because God, the Saviour who came, the Jesus who came, calls us to a holy life. That's the thing. He saves us from sin and then calls us to a holy life. And that's the message that we should be thinking about every day, not just at Christmas time. But that we are saved from our sins and called to a holy life. So the question is, do we ourselves recognize and understand that you know do we accept jesus as savior and do we accept that he has called us to a holy life and are seeking to live a life in his strength in his spirit living a holy life everything in our lives not just in the the bits when we're in church i think that's something which we can be thinking about i hope over the next uh, over the next few weeks but also are we praying for other people to recognize that too no, because this is a message, if this is true, and it is, this is a message which is, which is relevant to the whole world, to everyone. Now, not just to us here, but to, to everyone in the world. This is for, for, for everyone to hear and to respond to. And that's something that we need to be thinking about as well and, and praying for people to come to know, to repent of sin, to know the Lord Jesus. Praying for people to... To, to understand his call to live a holy life. And uh, you know, perhaps praying for people specifically. You know, I always say, God has given each of us people who are only known to us. There are people that only you know, who only you can pray for. Um, and you know, that's something that we need to be doing over these coming few weeks as well, isn't it? So let's remember that. Let's pray for ourselves to grasp the significance of what God has done in Jesus Christ. And pray that that significance would be uh, many people would come to understand in our community and in the world today. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us in Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for um, how wonderful it is to have a saviour like Jesus. 
And we pray that you would help us to grasp more deeply what you've done for us in Christ. And you would help us to live for you more and more. And we pray that you would help those in our community, um, our friends, neighbours, family, um, those who we know and love, and those out and about in the community that we, that we just come into contact with. Lord, we pray that your message would shine out this year and pray that uh, many people would hear the message and believe over these coming weeks and months. And uh, particularly, Lord, we pray that you would give us inspiration and perhaps as to who we might be praying for and um, who we can um, pray for and, and perhaps those we can share the gospel with. Pray that you would help us and give us courage and wisdom in doing that too. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.